See, so then it's just you and her. You know what I mean? Coolie. Coolie. Sounds great, though, other than that. Music, musicians, any notes? Good, good. Kristen, fantastic. DeAndre, awesome. We have eight minutes. Oh. Amen, brother. Class dismissed. You know why? Because that's why Nationwide is on your side. Okay, testing, testing one, testing one, two, three. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountainside and he sat down and his disciples came with him. Great. Whew.
morning, New Life Norwich. So good to see everyone. You guys want to stand with us? We join in worship.
Psalms 150, it says, praise the Lord, praise God in his sanctuary, praise him in his mighty heavens, praise him for his mighty deeds, praise him according to his excellent greatness, praise him with trumpet sound, praise him with lute and harp, praise him with tambourine and dance, praise him with strings and pipe, praise him with sounding cymbals, praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Everything that has breath, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Um, what I think we should take out of that is that our God is so unbelievably great that even if every tongue on this earth praised him, it wouldn't be enough. He's, he's everything. So, I encourage you to praise him, and with that, praise as loud as you can, so that you are now an example for others that hear you praising God and say, hey, what are they doing? You can be the example of Jesus on this earth. You'll never be close to Jesus, but you can praise him as loud as you can, and then God, he will work his way into other people's lives. God is unbelievable, and we should praise him. So everyone, praise God with everything you have. Um, right now, I'm just going to pray that we are able to meditate on his greatness, even though we'll never really grasp the full concept of it, but we are able to praise as loud and as authentic as we can. So, dear Lord, I just want to thank you so much for this amazing church that I have, Lord. I have such amazing people here, and I know that you love them with so much. It's unfathomable, Lord. I pray that with every fathom of our being, Lord, that we are able to praise you with everything we have. Even when it's hard, even when it goes against the ways that... We want to do, even if when it goes against our flesh, against the world, Lord, I pray that you give us strength to praise you and be an example of you and be a light where we are, Lord. Thank you so much for who you are and how much you love us. In Jesus' name, amen.
our heart posture and that everything out of our lips would be praise unto you because you are deserving of it just simply for who you are. Lord, that's just all that we want to do this morning is just speak your name, praise your name, lift you up.
Amen. Over every heart and every mind. Cause I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. We speak your name. We praise your name. Philippians 2 says, Therefore God exalted him in the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Let's pray. Oh Lord, how you love us. God, that you would send your Son from his rightful place in heaven that he would humble himself, not only taking the appearance of man, but serving man, even taking our place on the cross, that we may have life in him. Therefore, God, his name is above every other name. And we speak the name of Jesus over every person in this room, everyone who is connected to this place, Lord God, that is connected to you over every situation, Lord God. We speak the name of Jesus. There is power in his name. There is saving grace in his name. We just want to praise you, Lord, in this place today. We glorify you. You are glorified and you are welcome here, Lord God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is George. I want to welcome you here to New Life Community Church Norwich. Uh, Go ahead and take your seats, but before doing so, please turn around, greet somebody new. Got a packed house today. All right, all right, settle down. You can talk later. No, just kidding. We're family, I know. We, 
That's what happens when you like each other. <laughs> Again, good afternoon. My name is George. I want to welcome everyone here to New Life Community Church Norwich. If this is your first time joining us, we want to give you an especially warm welcome. Uh, there is a green and white card in the pew back in front of you that you can fill out. That's just a, our welcome card. And it's a way for us to get in contact with you to share all the things that are happening here at New Life. If you'd be so kind as to fill that out and then hand it to one of the ushers in the back when you leave, we'd like to give you a free gift uh, for saying thank you for joining, and we hope to see you again soon. Um, as we've been mentioning too, guys, this is a way that we get in contact with all of our um, church members um, week to week, and we put out some important information even throughout the week, so it's important that we have your information. So if you, you know, if you don't, if you're not getting those emails or if you've recently changed your email or phone number, please fill one of those out and uh, give it to the usher. We'll make sure we make those updates. Um, by way of announcements, um, I only really have one thing, and that is uh, the back to school drive, which thank you so much to everyone who participated in that. We got all those cards picked up last week. So I saw there's a bunch of backpacks and school supplies that are in the back. Thank you so much. Yep. Round of applause for everyone that did that. And if you haven't been able to bring your things in today, just please make sure you talk to Tracy before you leave and make arrangements to do that. We'd like to get these things uh, packaged up and uh, ready to go for the kids um, this week. So, and we will be praying for those, uh, those kids and everyone who's going to be uh, leaving for school here shortly. Um, so we'll be doing that in just a few minutes. Also, guys, you see we've got our baptismal set up up here. We've got... Amen. I, I know there's a lot of people in here. I expect this place to be really loud. We're going to blow the roof off this place later on. But, yes, we have four uh, young ladies who are going to be getting baptized today. So um, I can't wait for that. So, amen. And let's, we're just going to get back into it, guys. But uh, if you're going to be uh, tithing or would like to give an offering today, just uh, you could um, put it in one of the envelopes that are in the pew backs. And then um, just make sure that if you're writing a check, that it goes to New Life Community Church and write Norwich in the memo. And as always, you can give online, which is a fast and simple way of, of giving. Um, let's pray. First, uh, I want to read from John 15, 5. It says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So, Lord God, as, uh, as we read this, Father, um, we see that we're, we're called to live fruitful lives, Lord God. We are connected to you, and, and you are a, a, a gracious God, and you are a giving God. So we, are, we want to be givers. We want this place to be a generous church, Lord God. We can only do that with your help, Father. But, Lord God, we just ask for wisdom. We ask for um, just uh, wisdom, Lord God, to, to, to send these funds where, where you want them to go, Father God, and uh, that we, we will use these... Uh, these offerings wisely, Lord. And so we give in faith, Lord God. We, we ask that you would bless it and may it nourish this church. May it transform the lives of those who are here, Lord God, and, and, uh, and in the ministries that, that emanate from this place, Lord. And we praise you, Father God, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, new life. I'm super excited to jump into today a new series called One Church. This is a series that every one of our locations, all 27 from Elgin to Montgomery to Hammond to Hobart to Little Village and Midway and Lincoln Park, all across New Life, we are preaching this series. And this series is going to be about how we are the church of God and what the church is called to do. We are an amazing church that's been spread out all over the city for the good of the city. And we're really trying to transform this city with the power of the good news of Jesus Christ. And so this month, we're going to be doing something exciting. The first week, your pastor who's here is preaching this sermon. The next two weeks, you're having two different pastors from two different New Life locations come and preach to you through this one church series. And the final Sunday of the month, I'm going to be preaching to you on a video message in your screen. And I'm going to be talking about our theme, what I feel like God is placing upon my heart and our team's heart for where God is going to take us in the next few months. I'm telling you, this is going to be a powerful season. You don't want to miss it. So to take it away, your pastor is going to bring the message this morning. Let's give a huge round of applause for your pastor as they come up. Let's give it up for them. Oh man, I can't tell you how happy I am to be back here. 
I can't tell you, I was depleted when I left. I was depleted. I was out. When I'm depleted, my thoughts get screwy. And my thoughts were really screwy. I was at the end. But one thing that just overwhelmed me more than anything else is how everyone in this congregation comes together and how we support one another. And you know what? You can't fake that. You can't fake that. That's produced from genuine love. And the only way that you can have love for one another is connection. There ain't no other way. It's not sentimentality. It's literally something that is birthed out of the reality of one's heart. And I was overwhelmed. I was overwhelmed by the fact that, you know what, when I, when I uh, left and, and, and George came in and Kent came in and Jack came in, I thought to myself, man, we must be doing something right. We're right with God because it doesn't depend on any one human being. The church continues whether one comes or goes. Honestly, that's the greatest thing that we could ever hope for because it's always been about Christ. It's always been about his praise and glory. And as long as he's at the center, he will use his people to accomplish his goal. And can I tell you something? He's accomplishing a tremendous goal here. Let me tell you a couple different things. First of all, we have about... Uh, backpacks and school supplies for, I would say, about 30 children in our community. So let's give God praise for that. And let me tell you something. This wasn't leftover stuff. People took cards and bought specific backpacks for specific kids. Like, you know, one of the things that I think to myself is a kid doesn't have a whole lot. Maybe they're a little bit under-resourced in their family. They're kind of struggling to get by. They kind of get the brother, older brother's backpack, and it looks a little dirty and a little dingy. Man, that's not what we got back there. Man, we got Nike backpacks for these kids. And I'm not, you know what, listen, it ain't about a brand name. But it is nice to get something new once in a while. You know, God is not stingy. He's not. And I, I feel like sometimes we're fearful that he is. But listen to this. It's not only about the 30 kids we met right in, our, in, in our congregation. It's 80 children, 80, 80, plus our 30, that's 120, in the East Humboldt Park area. That means from Division Street South all the way to Independence Boulevard, from, uh, I would say, Pulaski all the way to Kedzie. This is a very depressed neighborhood with very little. We, through, through our obedience to God, have met the needs for 80 of their children. Let's give God praise for that. And this is just beginning. It's just beginning. I'm telling you, I thought to myself as we were worshiping, I thought to myself, did the apostles, did those 12 men understand that when they were at their lowest point and they were in that upper room and thinking to themselves, what just happened? Three and a half years and I saw this one that I thought was the one murdered mercilessly. What am I going to do? And here they are broken in this completely uh, uh, unhopeful state. And guess what? The Holy Spirit rushes upon them and out of this small, tiny room. And I assure you, this was a tiny room. This might have been probably from that wall to the end of this aisle. They were jam-packed in their praying, not knowing what they were praying or why they were praying or what the direction was that they were praying. And the Holy Spirit came on, and from that tiny room with those tiny, unremarkable people, he changed the world. That's not hyperbole. I'm not exaggerating. They were used to change the world. And it didn't take long for it to happen. And it's been happening ever since. And I think to myself, we are not only going to affect this area and the greater Chicago area, we are going to put roots. We are getting ready right now to finally get together with some people, our missionaries in Guerrero, Mexico, and we are going to affect the lives of children in other countries, families in other countries, and their families are going to be redeemed and reformed and restored in the name of Christ so that at the end, he's going to bring them up and say, look what my grace has accomplished. Man, I'm just pumped. I'm pumped. Who's pumped with me? Yeah. Woo! And it's good to get pumped for Jesus. You know why? Because Christianity is a fist fight. Anyone who says it's not, I don't think they're living it right. 
I'm just going to be honest with you. So listen, let's just pray. And we want to also pray, but we're, we're going to talk about them. Look at these beautiful faces over here, these young people. Man, they're so beautiful. They really are beautiful. And four of them are getting baptized. Not because a parent was going, Ugh, but because they said, I want to be counted for Christ. So, man, we're going to see that happen today. And I'm telling you, these are some exceptionally remarkable young people. And you know what? They're not little kids. They're adults right at that beginning age. You know, and I'm just excited. I can't begin to tell you. So, listen, let's pray for it all so I can shut up. Father God, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. I gotta, you got to help me. Because right now, my, I'm, I've got, man, i got overrun of the tongue. But, Lord God, I want to say only that which you want me to say. I want to speak of you. I want to lift you up. I want to exalt you. I want you to use me as if I were a microphone, as if I did not exist, and that you yourself were talking to your people. Lord, we want you. We need you. We need your nearness. Lord God, I pray that you would use us. I am not a worthy vessel. I have never been a worthy vessel. But Lord Jesus, you have made me worthy. It is your victory that we stand in. And Lord God, I pray that you would get all the exaltation and that you would get all the glory. And I pray for those people in this room that are resistant to come to you, that you would break down the walls that they have built and that they would rush in and say, I want Jesus as my Lord. I need Jesus as my Savior. Only you can quicken the heart. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Listen, let's open up our Bibles quickly because I'm going to preach quickly. Is that, yeah, who said that? Man, I'm going to have to have, we're going to have to have a rebuking room in this church. Well, it's very hard. You're right. You were being honest. Sometimes honesty is not a very pretty thing. It's very hard for me to preach quickly because uh, there's just so much. There's just so much to see. So let's open up our Bibles to Matthew chapter 4. And we're going to read, I would say, all the way into, hmm, no, I'm sorry, uh, Matthew chapter 5, we're going to read from verse 1 all the way to verse 16. Okay. All right, Jesus uh, is, uh, this is now a narrative, so in a narrative, I want you to understand that details matter. Okay, so I want you to pay attention to the details, and here it is. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down, and his disciples came with him. So Jesus came from lower ground to higher ground, and those who were his disciples followed behind him. So this tells us a very key thing in the very opening statement. To be a disciple means I'm going to follow Christ as he takes me ascended to higher ground. Now let me ask you a question. Is it easier to walk down a hill or up a hill? Up. It's easier to, right. It's easier to walk down a hill. No, no, no. It's easier to walk down a hill. Why? Because gravity. But Jesus is taking his disciples against gravity. He's taking us against the gravity of our own fleshly nature to the divine nature. And he's taking us step by step up to that place. So let's continue on. And he began to teach to them. And he said, blessed are you who are poor in spirit, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you who mourn, for you shall be comforted by God. Blessed are you who are meek, for the, weak, for the meek, not weak, meek shall inherit the earth, the blessings of God that were intended Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they're the ones that will feel satisfied and filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are the ones who are persecuted because of righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say things, evil things against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. Same, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets and the people of God before will be the way that they will persecute you. You, you, my children, are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. 
You are the light of the world. You are a town that is built on a hill. It should not be hidden, nor can it be. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, I want you to let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen? Man, I'm sweating like a hillbilly reading a book. That's not nice. That's not nice. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If someone could get me a napkin, I would appreciate it. I'm going to become a Baptist minister. All right, so here's, here's what I want to say. Uh, we are now approaching the four-year mark in our church together, and I want you to understand that salvation is not merely a religion. It is truly a spiritual marriage. Anyone who has been married knows that it is not a casual relationship. We have been called, oh, you are blessed. Um, so we are approaching that four-year mark of being a church. We are united with Christ and we're united with each other. And I like to think of these short years, they have been like a honeymoon. At least they have been to me. Now, uh, let me tell, talk a little bit about honeymoons. Anybody here been on a honeymoon before? Or at least those opening years of relationship. Uh, it, it's easy when you're on a honeymoon or in those opening years to be excited. It's easy to be agreeable when things are new. It's easy to be motivated. It's easy to overlook things that annoy you. Why? Because you're kind of filled and overwhelmed by this excitement that you have of being with this person. You're knowing them in a new way. You have a different kind of intimacy with them. There's a permanence. There's a confidence. You're like, man, it's okay. I can overlook this stuff. But, anyone give me an amen for that? But, Things become a little bit more difficult when the honeymoon phase is over and routine re-enters into life. Isn't that true? So the honeymoon part, great, easy. Man, we can do things. We can navigate this. I could do this forever. Then all of a sudden, you come back. You're living together for a little bit. Now you're bumping into one another. Um, you're seeing all the ugliness. Uh, you know, you, you see that your husband doesn't take showers every day. And your wife, she doesn't put on her makeup every day. And guess what? You're not always happy in the morning, and you're not always polite. So you kind of see these things. And at first, you're just like, man, I'm going to ignore them. But after a while, you kind of do this. White knuckle it, right? Is that true, or is it just me? Okay, who said it was just me? Nobody said Okay. It's not as though your love for the other person is gone, but it simply takes more effort to be passionate, to be eager, and to be motivated and positive when time goes on. Can I get an amen? amen? But that is what is necessary for us to complete our journey. I used to always complain to God when I got saved. Why don't you save us and take us? Why do you let us languish in a world that is constantly calling me back? It is constantly calling the Christian back to an adulterous relationship. I want you to understand it. That is the walk of the Christian. You are now married to Christ, and the world's like, remember that thing we had together? We could still have that. We could keep it on the down low. He don't need to know. Remember that fun we used to have? I'm telling you, that's the truth of Christianity. That's the truth of discipleship. That's the truth of walking and journeying with Christ. Why don't you just take us out of this world? But now I know that it is part of God's plan. Time is the engine that is used by God to mature and perfect his children. That means you and I cannot reach the place that he is taking us apart from time and pressure. If you don't have time and pressure, you will not mature and transform in the way that is necessary for, us to for him to take us into eternity. But there's a caveat to that. There's another side of that coin. Time is also an incredible test. It is also used by God to shake the tree. And you know what happens when you shake the tree? Dead leaves fall off of it. 
and nobody thinks they're a dead leaf until they fall off a tree. Nobody thinks to themselves, man, you know what? Something's not right. I don't think I'm getting the water because I feel like I could go any minute. It's just literally a shaking through life and time. And all of a sudden you go, you know what? I, I'm just too tired to come to church on Sunday. You know what? I, I know I used to be part of that small group, but I, I just, I can't do it no more. I, I can't. I, I'm tired. I'm tired from work. You know, that's what I was wrestling with. I'm like, man, there's got to be an easier way. But you know what the thing that kept propelling me forward, kept pushing me forward? Strangely enough, it wasn't Christ. It was you. It was you. I was like, if I pull back and run away, I cheat myself from God loving me through you. And I just said, if there's one thing I'm addicted to in this world, it's being loved. And I'm like, man, I'm not going to cheat myself. I'm not going to cheat myself. So you know what I did? I took a break. I waited for God to come upon me. He relieved some of that, uh, that pressure, that spiritual pressure and that hopelessness that I was kind of feeling. And now here it is. Lo and behold, that went away. And now I have encouragement. I have this kind of spirit of perseverance. I'm actually very excited. And it was all because of the love of Christ that he promises me in his church. Okay, it is my job to keep us motivated. It is my job to keep us passionate. I, myself, even though I have no power, am not willing that anyone would start down this path and run away. And I want you to be on the mission that I have been called to. That means you are going to live a life that takes responsibility for the person that is sitting next to you. You are going to use the eyes that God has given you to see the people who come and go in this place. And you are going to ask God to help you to love them in the same way that he loves you. That's how we're going to grow. And in my opinion here, listen to this. There's this guy, old guy Bruce. He's part of the old church, uh, the church that's, uh, that's, that's here and this guy was in it. He was a, he's, a, he's like the guys who pour the foundation. And you know what he said to me? He goes, he goes, I got to tell you this. He goes, when we cease to be, I want you guys to continue here. And I go, why? And he goes, I can't help but see how God is doing life here. That's what he said. Man, I was just overwhelmed by the idea that this is what God had put upon this guy's heart. God is doing life here. But one thing's for sure. If anyone departs because they're not in the vine and they don't get the water and they fade away, they will be cheated from the great victory that God is going to bring here. And I'm not willing to let that happen. I'm not willing to let that happen. So I want to say this. As we start in this sermon, and I literally have 12 minutes. That's just not going to happen. Um, things from this point are going to get tougher. Things from this point is not going to get easier. If I am right, and God is giving me a clear understanding of the future of our country and society, uh, by the year 2026, our country should be vastly different than we see it today. Incredibly different. And I'm not a prophet, but I do believe God is speaking prophetically to me. Vastly different, and that is three years, folks. That's three years. I believe the scripture reveals that when society as a whole chooses to operate in rebellion, God uses extreme disorder and chaos to bring order back. That's judgment. Judgment is not God hammering his people. It's God giving them over to disorder and chaos in order to get them sick of it so that they come back and say, help Help. That's what I believe we're heading into. So that means our job is going to get even more important. We need to be a visible witness to a world that is going to be immersed in chaos. We have to have order. We have to have passion. We have to have abundant love. And I'm not talking about that superficial form of love. I'm talking about the actual form of love, the actual definition of it, which is commitment and truth and, and, and loyalty. That's the kind of stuff that I think is going to catch the attention of a world that is going to be sunk into chaos. So I also believe that it is true that the church of Christ will go from good to better 
and from better to excellent. So we must be reminded weekly of what we have been called to. So here's the deal. I had, eh, I got pages. All right, we'll have to do this in two parts. No, I'm only kidding. Um, so I just want to say this. One of the overarching themes of the book of First and Second Peter, just kind of like given a synopsis, was this. You have been called. Well, that's great. We understand that. But what is the calling? It's got it. We got to get some kind of a meat on that, that skeleton. You've been called. I've been called. What have we been called to? Well, Peter calls it living as a sojourner or an alien in this world. That means I'm going to persevere in a land that is not my own under extreme difficulties at time. And I'm going to live with the mindset that even though I'm here, I still think like I belong here. Does that make sense? Okay, so I want to just give us a couple things that we're going to have to think it. I want to tell you what we are not called to. We are not called to aim our life at earning a spot in a celestial city with no pain, no hunger, no sadness, or no frustration. Can I tell you something? That's what builds lazy churches, and lazy churches are filled with lazy saints, and lazy saints fall away over time. There's thousands of examples of such. It's thousands. I need you to pray for the leaders here. I need you to pray that they would feel it first and most passionately so that their fire that has been placed in their heart by the Holy Spirit catches on to everyone around them. And I want us as a church to say, I am responsible. Say it, I am responsible. I'm responsible for my church. This is my church. I have been brought into this body, Christ's body, but I am part of it. And listen, man, we are all in this together. That means nobody's better than anybody else. Man, one of the things I saw, this great meme, that's what you call it, I guess, of a leader, a, a boss versus a leader. The boss is at the top and he's shouting, you people should get to where I am. And the leader's the one on his belly going, come on, let me help you up. Let me help you up. The other ones are striving to get through. That's the society that honors God, where there are leaders that are on their belly, that are using the backs of someone else to get to the next level, and then laying down and going, hold my hands, man. I'm going to pull you as someone's holding onto my feet. Do I make myself clear? Is that understood? Is that understandable? I mean, is that understandable? All right, we are not called to live in a celestial city. We are not called to live without labor or effort. We are, however, called to live in a confident expectancy. An expectancy that God will bring everything to a perfect conclusion. You know, that's what I lose track of most. When things get out of whack and things go from bad to worse, I start to say to myself, I don't think there's going to be a good end here. And when I don't think there's going to be a good end here, you know what I naturally do? My natural inclination is to start to pull back. I start to hedge my investment. You understand what I mean? We only fully ante in, put everything into the pot when we are absolutely certain that the pot will be ours at the end. We must live as though the greatest prize will be ours when we fully invest in. We fully invest in. This is what we are called to. All right, now I'm going to skip a lot of stuff because now I want to give you some meat and potatoes. How are we to persevere? There's three things. Because we're going to stop here and we're going to bring everybody up at about maybe 50 minutes after. I said 45, but I got to cheat it by five minutes. We are called to persevere. How are we called to persevere? And what are we called to persevere in? First of all, like I told you, we're not striving for a spot in heaven. We're not striving to say, God, look at how good I am. That is not our motivation. We are already in. We've been brought in by Christ. We're hidden in him. Now our motivation is completely different. What does it look like on a very basic level? The first thing is this, and I've understood it. Poor in spirit. Never really quite understood it. I knew what the definition was, but I'm really starting to grasp what poor in spirit means. And this is what I believe, and I'm confident that it means that I need to keep my conscious, personal contact with Jesus. It requires from me mental effort. I must live with the recognition 
of my need for God's grace. Do you need God's grace? Not everybody said yes. You know why? Not everybody believes it. We sometimes mouth it. We sometimes think of it. And you know why we don't always believe it? Because we have put a lot of effort in our lives to being independent. It is a very hard habit to break. It needs divine strength to tear down the stronghold of independence. We are always in need of God, but when you find yourself in need of God, you somehow are never needy. There is a difference. There is a complete difference. But we must strive by the Holy Spirit to be poor in spirit, which means I recognize daily before I put my feet on the ground, Jesus, I need you. I need you to treat my wife with the respect that she deserves. When I don't feel that she deserves that respect. I have to go to my job and give my effort to an employer that does not care about me and will discard me as soon as it is beneficial for them. I have to work for Christ who is going to reward me in the way he chooses to reward me, not the way that I think he should. I need God to be a vibrant part of his body. That means I'm not always a leader. Sometimes I'm just part of the group. But you know what, though? My participation is integral to what God wants to do here. That means I show up. I show up. Sometimes I don't say anything. Sometimes I'm called to lead. That's not just me. That's everyone. That's what happens when you, by grace, understand poorness of spirit. And if you're poor, if you, if you have the God-given gift of poorness of spirit, you know what's going to happen? You are going to find yourself dependent on the pools of grace. All right? I, I believe this. When we, by poorness of spirit, understand that, that I am dependent on him... God the Father then gives his son to us in a very meaningful way. It's no longer a theology that a teacher teaches me or something that I agree with that's written in a book. It now becomes intensely personal. Let me tell you how it becomes personal to those who are poor in spirit. I believe Jesus for us becomes everything. He becomes my strength of heart. He becomes my confidence in times of weakness because I don't know about you. I feel weak at times. When I was at my end, I was physically weak, physically weak. My mental weakness had crossed over the line. My nervous system was like this. I felt weak. I was like, I, I don't think I could take another step. That's not an exaggeration, folks. And you know what? If someone says, well, you're weak, I'll say, you're right. <laughs> right, right. Jesus isn't just a crutch for me. He's my wheelchair. That's the truth. And you know what? The one who's willing or able to say that by grace, do you know what he becomes? Everything. He becomes strength for me. He becomes the confidence in my heart when I do not naturally have confidence. I'm broken. I'm alone. I feel empty. He becomes the filler of my soul. And can I tell you something? If he doesn't become the filler of your soul, you know what will happen? You'll find other fillers. You'll find other stuff. Maybe it'll be food that you know you shouldn't be eating and you shouldn't be eating that much. Anybody do that one? Oh, I did it for about six months. Everything sweet with caffeine. You know what? Or worse. You know, we could use more powerful things to help us to escape. Some people escape into the world of pornography or relationships. Some people escape into the world of Netflix and videos. Some people escape into the world of materialism because the world's just constantly like, come on, man, come on. Come on, man. We, I can give you what you want. You need another jersey. That's what's going to fill your heart. You need another pair of Converse. Because that's really what's going to help you feel good. Well, you know what the truth is? It does help you feel good for about 30 minutes. But then you realize, I probably paid for that with money I shouldn't have used. 
And right? So now you start to feel a double sense of emptiness. But when Christ becomes your filler, somehow, like he says, he becomes a stream of water that wells up and cannot be stopped within you. It becomes enthusiasm. It becomes passion. You know what? I know that God is actively gushing in my life. I am overwhelmed by purpose. You know what? I told you, I got saved from addiction. That means I longed for something, and I could never find it. When Christ came on the scene, immediately I said, that's it. That's the thing. That's the one I needed. And every time I'm depleted, he proves I was right. He gives again and again and again, and I feel my sense of purpose. And you know what purpose is? The real purpose of our life is something that's greater than my happiness or my immediate need. It's me being sacrificial, living sacrificially, joyfully for the good of another person. Somehow that's the greatest meal I could ever eat. The most satisfying action of my life. And strangely enough, when grace is what produces it, I don't want to wear it on my shoulder. I feel as though it's a gift. It's like an undeserved privilege. I'm like, of all the people you could have chose, why did you choose me? You know, I'm telling you, that's how you persevere in this game. That's how you persevere. It produces in me a dependence on the pools of grace. One of the things that I know about humanity is this. Whatever I find myself dependent on, I will not depart far from. Is that true? All right. When this becomes the truth of your life, prayer no longer is seen as a chore. It now becomes a place of relief and refreshment. I'm no longer talking to you about this when you can't do anything about it. I talk to the one who knows my heart completely. You know, I was talking to someone the other day, and I said, you know, one of the amazing aspects of being the elect is that when Jesus suffered in his 33 years of life, He didn't just suffer some pain. He suffered the exact pain of his chosen. Did you hear me? That means the pain you felt from rejection, the pain pain you might have felt from abandonment, the pain you felt from unworthiness, he suffered the pain. The the arrow of it, the exact pain. So when you, through prayer, by grace, go to him, he can say to you without a blink of an eye, yeah, I know what you're talking about. He becomes for us in, in, uh, for, uh, God, the perfect high priest who is able to represent us by saying, Father, I have felt this man's pain. I have felt this woman's pain. I know her brokenness and I stand in her place. So when he lived, he lived to absorb the pain that we feel every day. So now by grace, we can bring those things to him. Prayer is not a chore. Do you know what one of our, you know what we should have more people at than anything else? The first Monday of every month, prayer. Do you know why? It will accomplish great things. You want things to be torn down in your life? Pray with the saints. If you want things to be torn down in other people's life, pray with the saints. If you want to see God do things and turn things and make rivers go in different directions, pray with the saints. That's what we've been called to. That's what we've been called to. Can I get an amen? Amen. Here's the next thing. Scripture. Scripture now becomes before me by grace a support belt that strengthens my core and protects my inner man. It's no longer something that hurts me and punches me and inflicts wounds upon me. I saw it the other day and it was like a lightning bolt. In Christ, he has removed the sting of the law. That means the law no longer has the same work for those who are apart from Christ in my life. It's not like we don't have the law But now it becomes something I desire. It becomes something that I cling to. I wrap my arms around. I believe the law for the saint becomes a promise. When we heard before the sting of the law, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. And if you don't, you're going to hell. Now, by grace, God's saying, you will 
love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. That's, that's what the scripture becomes. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's not hyperbole. That's a quote. And it can't be taken away from me. You know why? Because only Christ can. And he was the one who earned it. And he said, if he didn't condemn you then but gave himself for you, how will he not give you all these other things as well? Who could bring charges against the elect? Oh, Paul, man, I can't wait. I can't wait. Here's the next one. True fellowship. That's the church. That's the strength, folks. See, some people think, well, I'm a Christian. I could survive on prayer, and I could survive on Scripture. But apart from the congregation, you will lose your direction. You will lose your direction. You will endanger yourself. You will make yourself an object for target, and you will lose your direction. It's the same. If you stayed in your house by yourself for a whole year, and you listened to only your mouth, you would be pretty insane when it was over. That's the way it is. Let me tell you what happens by grace to those who embrace the fellowship. It becomes for me a joy. You become for me a joy. That's not something I wrote down. I feel it. I love these people. I love this man. He came when he was a teenage kid, and I was like, man, I love this kid. I don't even know him. And now I know him, and I love him. I, I kid you not, like you were my own brother. I love you. That's not something that, that well, you got to say that. No, I don't have to say it. I don't have to say it. But I do have to say it. Because it is so true. When these two ladies were with these young girls the other day, they cried when they gave their testimony. And I cried when they gave their testimony because it was so heartfelt. And the brokenness that Jesus pulled them out of. And my desire was for all that God had for them in their life. I was overwhelmed by it. That's joy. That's joy. You're not going to find joy only loving the things you want to love. Never. You know why? Because when you love only the things you're loving, you may think you're loving them, but really you're only loving yourself. Love really is when you love other things that you have no reason to love. That's the way it is with the kingdom. Don't blame me. It becomes, it becomes now by grace a place for me to find fulfillment. You know how I find fulfillment? In loving other people. Because if I do not love you, I will love myself more. Is that wrong? It can be. You know why? Because when I focus my love on myself, it becomes a very unhealthy love. And you know what? The thing that I'm certain that it's going to accomplish in my life, it really truly doesn't accomplish. It's like, well, if I truly get that, if I just get this, if I just get that, and if I just get this, and then I get those things, and it's like, well, it's not quite what I thought it was. So I, I need a little more, and I need a little more, and I need a little more. The only time I start to feel good, when I diminish from those wants, and I start to want what's good for you, and love you, and care for you, and be committed to you, it's not just for the pastor or the elder. It's for the saint. We're all one in this. We're all one in this. I got to be quick now, real quick. Oh, man, real quick. Blessed are those who mourn. We have to persevere in mourning. Why? Because those who mourn want the comfort of God. They recognize and embrace their dissatisfaction in the world. As you get closer to God, you must become more dissatisfied with this world. It is a safeguard for your soul. Even those things that glitter, somehow you know, even if I grab that thing, it ain't going to fill me up. So when I realize that, I realize that my desire is something outside of time and space. That means I tend to look at him more. Now, by grace, I see as a mourner, God, you have proven to me that I matter to you. Do you believe that God thinks you are important to me? Do you believe that? There are many Christians who do not believe that. They may mouth it. They may sing it. They may even repeat it to other people, but they do not believe it. You know how I know that? Because I sometimes don't believe it. 
I don't matter to God. How could he ever love someone like me? God, he, you matter to him. Not only do you matter to him, but he has the power to save you. It doesn't matter if you matter to me, if I have no power to affect your life, but he has all power to affect your life. He has all power to bring true prosperity into your life, to build up your heart, to nurture you, to bring you into a place of maturity where you begin to look more and more like him. That's what he does. He says, I will focus my love on you with a bright and intense shining until you start to look like my love. All right, listen, they're coming up. That means I got to shut up. <laughs> this is the last part, promise. We must persevere in weakness. And I'm going to bring this down to a real quick thing. Meekness is this in the life of the believer. It is confidence in the mastery of Jesus. There are many people who fear Jesus as their master because they're suspicious. They, they're suspicious and they're fearful. So they pull back. They protect themselves. They never really give themselves fully over. You know why? Because in this world, all we ever see is people who misuse power. Whenever they have supreme power, they misuse it. So we assume that God will do the same thing. He will not. He will not. The one who is meek says, I trust myself to you. Let me give you, let me give you what it means for him to be a master. And this will be the last, last word. He will become for us a person of supreme ability. You want your marriage better? Turn your heart over to Christ more. You want to be a better parent? Get closer to Christ. You want to find greater joy in the world full of McDonald's? Turn your heart closer to Christ. Give yourself over to the one who has supreme ability and power. He's the one who is able to control and navigate with the sillful certainty that he will get us to the other side. But here's the best part, and this is it. He's not just a pilot, or he's not just a, a, an artist or a craftsman. He's our older brother. He's the head of the household of Christ. So when he fights for you, he doesn't fight for you as someone who's like, well, I, I have to fight for her. He fights for you like the Father fights for you because he loves you in the same way the Father does. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whosoever should believe in him would live forever and never perish. You're the one he so loved. And Christ navigates skillfully over our life because he wants us to prosper. Let's stand up and get ready to celebrate. Are you guys ready to celebrate? Yeah. All right. Ladies, why don't you come up with your, with your, uh, your, your sponsees, your, your mentors. And what we're going to do is we're going to listen to these beautiful young adults uh, give their testimonies of what Christ has done and where, where he's brought them. Okay. Poor you. You draw the short straw. You're the first one. All right, let's, let's, I'll hold this. I'll okay. hold it for you. You don't have to worry about that. All right. Oh, okay. My name is Alyssa, if you guys don't know, and this is my testimony. Woo. I remember one Sunday, Pastor Tom talked about this visual of Jesus being tied up to a post and getting whipped. And he talked about how he pictured Jesus' eyes specifically looking at him, not with regret, sorrow, pain, nor anger, but with love. And with love comes heartbreak. My testimony comes with three heartbreaks. One being a fatherless, which led me to feel not worthy of love. However, Jesus gave me a father who will always remain. Romans 8:38 through 39. For I am sure that neither death or life, angels or rulers, the present or future, heights or depths, or anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. The second heartbreak is being abandoned, which led me not to trust others as much. Oof. and feel alone at times. But okay. I'm not. <laughs> this was me being his living testimony through hardships. Because Jesus comes again in 2 Corinthians 4, 9 through 10. We are persecuted but not abandoned. 
struck down but not destroyed, we always carry around in our body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. The last and third heartbreak comes from myself for being so hard on myself, <laughs> overthinking, being anxious about the future, becoming so much of the world and yet so little of myself, for hiding my inner child and not letting her breathe, and for falling into brokenness. And Jesus finally eases my mind in Jeremiah 29, 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. And that promise was uh, is where I continue to persevere because Jesus loved me so much, he died on the cross for me, and he endured with me through all these heartbreaks. He never left me. He brought me back to a church through people I love. He gave me a church family who cares so much for me. He gave my inner child the air to breathe again, and he gave me love in my lowest and highest moments, and he gave me a purpose. Today I accept Christ as my one and true Savior. I will be his living sacrifice. <laughs> Hi, I'm Paula. Um, growing up in a Catholic family, I knew about Christ, but I didn't truly know him. I instead found myself up in found myself caught up in religion rather than a relationship. I never knew what it meant to have a personal relationship with the only one capable of offering guidance and purpose to my life. Before coming to sincerely know him, I was beyond doubt lost. I constantly found myself with an intense feeling of emptiness and with so, I also found myself so easily turning to the world to fill that void. There was nothing that I did that was able to offer me the satisfaction that I was so desperately looking for. Turning to the world seemed appealing, but truthfully only left me more broken and alone. I had grown into someone who was afraid, miserable, and disconnected from not only everyone, but everything around her. The more I turned to worldly desires, the more hopeless I started to become. I realized that I had turned into a person that I had hated, but that in itself is able to show the beautiful nature of God. At my lowest, he allowed himself to reveal that Christ is the only one able to offer something that no temporary escape would ever fulfill. At this point in my life, I had isolated myself from basically all those who I considered close. Not knowing who else to turn to, I decided to order my first ever Bible out of curiosity. The more I read, the more the Lord would pull me in closer. I found that what he offered was love, compassion, and forgiveness for the sins that held me boundless in an endless cycle of hopelessness. Looking back at it, it felt terrible to feel so empty and lonely, but I thank God for doing so. He had to force me to be alone in order to grab my attention. Yet I am a sinner, and apart from him, I'll always remain a sinner. God had demonstrated a love so strong that is able to forgive all. I confess that Christ saved me from all of my own wickedness and sins. My baptism today is a reflection of the relationship I have grown to have with Christ, one of which offers me a new life. Jesus Christ is able to pull me away from my own iniquity, and only by his grace and mercy is able to extend forgiveness for the sinful life I was entrenched in. Through him and by him, I am saved and deemed worthy. The blood of Christ is able to save me from what nothing else in the world could ever possibly come close to. Through Christ, I am able to die to my old life and live one of which glorifies the God that so patiently offered a life worth living. Christ died for me while I was still an enemy, and that is the ultimate love that many, including myself, crave. Every day I am made new in him, and I pray that I continue to grow in his path. As taken from 1 Peter 3.21, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, that was like a theological treatise. My name is Andrea. I've been going to New Life for about a year now. Before coming to this point where I'm standing here before y'all, my life before Christ was different. I lived for this world without even realizing it. I was desperately trying to control my life, to fill a void. I felt unlovable, and I felt worthless. It was selfish and damaging to live this way. It led to a lot of anger and depression, and I believed I was the only one who could fix it. It was by God's grace that I came to him. I was blessed to grow up knowing God from a young age. My mother always taught me the importance of God, but again, I was still a kid and wasn't fully there yet. It wasn't until there was a time these past recent years that I was struggling and desperate, and this time I couldn't pull myself out. I was struggling mentally to the point I had warfare with myself. It was honestly joining the young adults was a turning point for my path of faith. I started to put Christ first, the fellowship growing and learning together was truly unbelievable to me. But I knew God put, put me there, saving me from being of this world. Jesus became my soul strength during these times as I became closer and more involved with the faith. 
I learned of love, and not just worldly love, but godly love, an unconditional love that no one but Christ himself could ever love me. A love so great that he sent his one and only son into this world that I, I mean, we live through him. I didn't even realize it was Jesus this entire time. He was the one I was chasing my whole life. And with this realization and the help of others, it really pushed me for the next step of baptism. At first, I didn't want to get baptized. I hated public speaking, and I just felt that I wasn't ready enough, I wasn't lovable enough, and I wasn't worthy enough. However, in the Bible it says, when I saw this verse, Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. And I realized I'm not here for myself today, but to glorify God and his grace he had on me to help me relinquish my anger, my pain, and reluctance to take control. Hello, my name is Anna, and I'm 18 years old. I was first introduced to the church in Christ from a very young age, but I did not have a relationship with him. I did not know him like I could have. I had no relationship with him. This led me to live a, li uh, live a worldly life, a life of sin. From a very young age, I chased love and did things I'm not proud of. I didn't realize I was looking for godly love, not just in relationships, but in friendships. And each one I've passed, I became more desperate. I watched other people experience broken love, and it made me hopeless. I wondered why I felt so alone, why I felt I was unlovable. This had led me to feeling empty and constantly feeling unsatisfied, depressed, anxious, and abandoned. But I learned that God has unconditional love. God will love me like no one else. God has loved me from the moment I came into this world and has continued to love me even when I try to pull away and walk my own path. I came to Christ when I was at my lowest. I felt alone. I was scared. I thought I was too far gone to be saved by the Lord. I thought he had abandoned me. I felt I wasn't worth being saved. I felt so far from my faith. My world around me was flipped up upside down, and I felt so out of control. I didn't want to be here anymore. There were nights I begged the Lord to just take me with him. My life changed when I joined the young adults group. My mom and sister had continued to push me to go, continued to encourage me, and if anything to remember, I was doing this for God and no one else. This group had, had uplifted me from the beginning. They have blessed me with the knowledge of our Lord and showed me how important fellowship is. The young adults group helped me in so many ways, but what I'm most grateful is they helped me gain a relationship with God. I can never thank you guys enough. I am being baptized today because I've seen what God has done for me. I've seen what he's done for the people I love most. He's shown me unconditional love, a love I can get from no one but him. No matter how broken I am, no matter how much I struggle, God loves me, and he will not abandon me. 1 Corinthians 13, verses 4 through 5. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. I want to love how the Lord loves me. I want to walk the path God has for me. I want to leave my old self behind. I repent, Lord. I want to live, Lord. I want to live along. I want to live alongside you, my God. Uh, okay, let's take them in. Let's, uh, Louis, you help them in, and uh, Margie uh, on one side, and Margie, you want to come on one side? George, you're here. Get her at the end.
I do the picture of anime, please play your song. Okay? And I, I want to say this, you know what, what I told you in the beginning, what's happening here is breaking free from the, the geographical boundaries. My daughter was in Israel last week, and uh, if we could show that picture, maybe, possibly, maybe no picture. Well, she was uh, baptized, uh, there it is. She was baptized in the River Jordan. So let's just praise God for everything that he's done and everything he's going to do. Because October, October, we're going to have four more. They're already ready to go. So let's praise God. Come on, church, let's sing from my Let's bring them up. Let's sing it. Let's sing it. Let's sing it. Church. Come on! Come on! 
the leadership uh, in this, I don't know, the ladies that come up, they didn't take the microphone. They did their work when only two eyes were on them, and that was Jesus' eyes. <laughs> Look at this guy here, map, mopping away. Look at this man coming up here, just bringing people up. Lord, I, I, I can't begin to thank you enough. And you know what? If, if, if you're here for the first time, and you're, uh, you know, you're a little bit uncomfortable because it's hot in here. You know what that is? It's Jesus sweating the hell out of you. <laughs> Every time I come up here, man, I, it's Jesus sweating the hell out of me. And you know what? He's going to win. He's going to win. Can't lose. So let's receive the benediction and praise God and go forth praising. Paul speaking his says, for I am sure, absolutely confident of this, that neither death nor life no angel, no ruler, nor anything present, nor something that may come. There's no power, there's no depth, there's no height. There's nothing else in all creation, listen, that will be able to separate us, his chosen, from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And that's a promise. Father God, you are awesome in your ways. And I pray by your mighty hand, your strength, by your power, you would hold us and let no one snatch us from your hand. I pray that you would mold us and you would shape us, that you would make our hearts look like Christ, Lord God. Live like Christ, love like Christ, sacrifice Christ, so that you would be exalted, you would be magnified. And in your magnificent and magnification, Jesus, you being lifted up, you would call all men unto yourself and you would bring the dead out into everlasting life. Lord, I know you're going to do this, and I'm confident in Jesus' name. And the saints said...